Hi, it's George Nordhaus, and welcome to Monday Morning. We are going to talk about something different. I know I say that every week, but who ever thought of a multi-generational workforce workforce being vital, vital, vital to the insurance industry? But it is. And I learned that from Sharon Emick, uh, who is the head of WAVE. And you might have heard of WAVE. If you haven't, you will. Uh, it's quite an organization. There's her picture. She, uh, Sharon is... Uh, uh, quite a, a interesting person. She has her PhD from Rutgers University. She actually taught uh, uh, insurance uh, there. I mean, no, you taught English, didn't you, uh, there. Uh, she's already mm-hmm. received so many uh, awards. As you can see them all there. I won't even begin to go down them for you because she's very well uh, recognized. Um, I didn't realize you were you had an agency yourself or, or you were a partner in an agency early on, right? Well, I started my own agency back in the uh, late '80s. Well, from yeah. nothing, from yeah, well, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And then, and then you, and then you went on into. Uh, well, look at all those awards. I mean, you can go on and on because what she's done here for the, uh, uh, for the women of the world, and, uh, and but more importantly, I mean, well, what and what she's learned in the process, and what we're going to share now. So later on, come back and look at all this list because it's uh, it's so impressive. I don't know where to begin, but I do know that she and I have talked for a while. I have heard of her organization called WAVE, that's W-A-H-V-E, which she'll tell you about in a minute on on the way out. But uh, she also is really a change agent. And that's what I like about her because she understands one of the things, but she understands change. And uh, let's talk about change. Let's start it that way, Sharon. Okay. Well, um, I'm sure many people who are on this call, who um, will be listening to this, will know that they look back over their lifespan. I'm sure they're going to see a lot of change that way they have gone through. Um, but I just wanted to put change in perspective um, because you, we need to understand what's happened over time. Change has gotten to be very, very condensed now. I mean, for from 10,000 10, BC to 1700 AD. We were in the agricultural age. Change was so minimal over thousands and thousands of years. And then from, then from 1700 to 1970, we went into the industrial age. That's when we finally began to figure out how to manufacture things. Um, and that lasted for 270 years. And then the information age. So until 1970, we were sitting in a similar kind of approach to everything. And, and actually, that's also called the production age, where we made things. We, and a lot of how we even operate today in our businesses is still based on the production age model, where we think we are, the way we do job descriptions and procedures has still to do a lot with that industrial age production mindset. Um, in fact, we call our salespeople producers, mm-hmm. which is an interesting mm-hmm. you know, thought. I mean, today you talk to young kids and you say, oh, you'll be a producer. They think they're going to produce a movie or something or a video <laughs> or a YouTube something. Right. Don't think of a producer necessarily as a salesperson. Uh-huh. And then we went from the information age starting in the 70s, which everyone thought would last a longer time, but it's actually changed in 2010 because we we now had all that information we had the technology the computers we had the um, the the web um, and so information was now at everyone's fingertips um, and but so then there was a, a huge change and they're calling it sort of the make no one really knows what they're calling this yet they say the maker age because we share we create we collaborate mm-hmm. Um, there's this new concept called design thinking, um, and we're also saying, well, maybe we're, we should call it the disruptive age because everyone's now talking about disruptors, yeah. and um, and we do have a lot of disruptors. In fact, the changing workforce, the dynamic of the multi-generational workforce is actually disrupting how we're going to be able to manage our, our own companies. So. Um, more and more people begin to think, well, maybe we should call it the disruptive age. But in any case, that's going to end in 2020. <laughs> you know when I, what I, will come oh, I was just going to, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but I, you know, when I, when, uh, when, in 2001, I'm looking at that now, I made a speech somewhere. I, mean, I used to speak a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, don't need more, but mm-hmm. I made a speech somewhere to a big group of agents, 2001, now, just to put this in perspective. And I said, how many of you have ever bought anything over the internet? And there must have been three or 400 people, and there were three. Three hands that went up, Sharon. Three mm-hmm. <laughs> of three hundred people. Now that's how. I mean, that's how close the best was. I mean, we all remember two thousand one. So, at any rate, I'm just saying it. I, what changed? Yeah, 
I know. Look at the X right. Everyone buys over the internet today. Retailers are worried that, you know, that's why I'm always amazed. When I, the reason why this slide is so important is because I know many insurance firms say their staff resists change. Whenever they're bringing in something new, they say, why do I have to do this? They, mm -hmm. it, it, and that's what they don't realize, and your point is very valid, that in 2001, hardly anyone bought on the internet. If you tell them today, okay, what if I took away Amazon? Oh, don't, don't, don't. You know, please. what would you do? What if I took away Google <laughs> what, or, or Facebook or LinkedIn? What if you couldn't Skype your grandchildren because you live on the opposite side of the country? <laughs> you all are going through change. All the staff have gone through a lot of change in their personal lives. Mm -hmm. So you just have to bring that change into your work life and say, you're living it every day. So it's not anything new. And then after, I mean, I remember just a quick story before we go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. When I bought my husband his iPhone, he had a flip phone until four years ago. He resisted mm -hmm. and resisted. And he was texting <laughs> our son on, an, on, a, on a flip phone. You know, and you know what that's like. Yeah. A, B, C, D, E, yeah. F, G. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, I don't know. So for his birthday, I bought him an iPhone. He was so angry at me. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the phone out the window. This is the worst birthday present I ever got. <laughs> Today, I say, put away that iPhone. You're in bed. It's 12 o'clock at night. He sleeps with his iPhone. He can't part with his <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. So I said, who are you married to, your iPhone or me? <laughs> <laughs> Good girl. Oh, that's yeah, so, and he resists change all the time. Mm -hmm. But once he adopts the change, he mm -hmm. will never go back. He yep. loves it. So true. So, so that's the perspective about change. And mm -hmm. that's happening faster and faster. And, it's, and, and, and a lot of the change is so much better for our lives. Mm -hmm. um, it's just getting over that first hump of learning it. Amen. So, all right. So, so the last 20 years has changed everything. Um, if you look at advances in medicine, technology, communication, I mean, I mean, today we have 3D printers, so that you can you can um, uh, on demand create a body part if you need to have a knee replacement, and you're in some place where you can't get that. I mean, they can create them. It's amazing. What technology is doing is also extraordinary. I, I can control all the energy in my house from my iPhone. Um, I mean, I used to be, you know, you could come to your house and have your lights on. And you don't have to waste energy because you can lower the heat and raise the heat from wherever you are. So when you come to the house, it, it works fine. And communication is everywhere. I mean, you can communicate in so many different ways. If you can't reach, if you couldn't reach someone by phone, mm -hmm. and it, it was impossible. I mean, you have email, you have texting, you have so many ways. LinkedIn, you have Facebook. There are so many ways that we can connect today that we were unable to do in the past. And of course, this has led to a dramatic change in everything. We have a longer, healthier life. We have a new shared economy now. Imagine you can have an on-demand Uber show up at your door or a Lyft. Um, <laughs> you can um, you have Airbnb where you can now get, um, you don't you don't have to go to a travel agent to go find a a, a a home to rent in a foreign country if you want to stay there or, or a place to stay. I mean, I go to visit my kids in LA and I go on Air, um, Airbnb and I and I rent a house. You know, for all of us to have Thanksgiving together, I could never do that. You know what? You know, so the shared economy is dramatically changing everything. It's just wild. You know, uh, this morning in uh, Santa Fe, where I live, uh, there's a big lawsuit uh, by the people that own the, the uh, uh, places that they they rent and pay taxes against Airbnb. They said they're not paying taxes. They're not doing all the things that we've done. They're taking our business away from. That's something new too. Who'd ever would have thought that would be happening? I don't know what's going to happen. I know. It's fascinating. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. Well, 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 the thing is the shared economy is so new, eventually the dust will settle and everyone will figure out how to manage it. Right. Same thing with which was happening with the internet. You know, it took time for everyone to figure out how to manage that too. Sure. Um, so, um, but the shared economy is definitely transforming. It's disrupting a lot of businesses. <laughs> you know, so. Mm -hmm. Tell me about and it. And of course, <laughs> and that creates, you know, and, and that brings constant workplace changes. I mean, both. The, the the change in our lifespan and how the, the shared economy or the technology the way we communicate yep. is definitely impacting our, our work okay so we all know mm. in the insurance industry this is what our desks used to look like <laughs> that's good I love that <laughs> it was overwhelming the stress from all the paper okay and this next slide is going to tell you what's happened to us in the last 20 years watch this carefully 
from 1981. Watch this desk and what's happening to the various items on the desk. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh. You won't believe the change if you just look at everything that was there. Remember your old facts? <laughs> your facts? Gone, gone, gone. Remember your roller decks? Uh, vaguely. <laughs> oh, and all the business cards you used to have. And say, oh my God, what am I going to do with all these business cards? How can I keep track? <laughs> this is a great. This is great. Wow, <laughs> that is wonderful. So this is where we are today. Imagine yep. that. Yep. Now the question is, what are we going to have next? I mean, uh, uh, now everyone's working on a tablet. That that laptop is becoming extinct to the next generation. Because, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, Gen, Gen um, uh, Millennials and Gen Z, they're, they're working on tiny little devices and they think that's fine. So, um, I imagine what the slide's going to look like in another 10 years. Okay. Anyway, so let's go back to what's really happening to our workforce because that's basically what this, you know, conversation is about. Right. So what's really affecting our workforce dramatically is the changing lifespan. Um, you know, 10,000 boomers are turning 65 every day for the next 18 years, which is um, extraordinary. If, you know, you just go back 20 years ago and re everyone said, oh, retirement age is 65, and most people didn't live beyond 65. I mean, it was based on the fact, you know, all our retirement plans are based on the fact that not that many people would live longer than that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when you retire within a few years, you usually die. Yeah. It's changed dramatically. So, you know, today, one in five Americans are 55 and older, and one-third of the labor force will be 55-plus years old by 2016. Mm. And life expectancy today, women live to 81, men to 76. Well, I hope it's going to be more than that, because <laughs> I've already, <laughs> well, already passed that one, baby. <laughs> Go ahead. I know. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what they also say, George, they say that the other statistic is one in five Americans will be 65 or older by 2030. Can you imagine? Mm -mm. One in five Americans mm -mm. will be 65 or older by 2030. That's oh a huge God. number. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's huge. And, you know, and, he, and the, you know, insurance industry, you know, we're predicting this 50% boomer retirement over the next eight years. And that's a huge, you know, challenge to us because we haven't been training enough young people to take, you know, to um, over time to get that institutional knowledge so we wouldn't feel that huge yeah. void when that happens. Good but point. Yeah, that's unfortunately, great. Unfortunately, we all know the industry hasn't attracted enough young people, and one of the things we'll talk about is why the industry is having a hard time keeping the millennials, which okay. they now need to keep Good. and train. So. Hmm. All right. So, the key in running your workforce and, and having them work together well as a team is understanding the differences in the generations. There are really quite significant differences. Um, and so the silent generation, which they're still in the workforce. <laughs> mm -hmm. Look at you, George. Yeah, I, I go to many, you know, um, right. and many um, meetings across the industry, and you see the principles of all the brokerages and the agencies majority of them are, are, many of them are silent generation or, or at the very high end of the boomer generation. Um, you know, so you can see that, and they're staying longer, they're running their agencies longer because they know they're living longer and, and, it's, and they know it's better for them, it's healthier for them. Their mind stays active and they continue to stay in the workforce. But that silent generation, they were rule followers. They trusted authority. They were team players. They were very stoic. If things didn't go well, they stuck to their job forever, even if they didn't love it, because they had a, they felt they had to make a living and and, and and they had to just do their job and get paid for their job, and and they didn't question. They were you know they followed the rules and right. they didn't rebel. <laughs> right. Then you get the boomer generation. So they work in a different way. You give them anything, they'll do it. And, you know, and they won't question. The boomer generation, well, they broke the rules. You know, they, they uh, wanted to do something different. They began a lot of innovation. They were uh, very individualistic about, you know, they, they had their own views of things. Um, and they, they respected diversity, but they're not totally comfortable with it. You mm -hmm. know, it was a new thing for them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they wanted to be empowered, but they also wanted financial independence. So they would keep to a job also because they wanted, the they wanted to make the money, 
Um, and the boomer generation right now has probably is the wealthiest generation because they did make that money. And that was very important to them. So they didn't go from job to job. So it, it's a very interesting thing because I, I was on a panel with a bunch of HR people, HR um, people at brokerages mm -hmm. and insurance companies. And there were young people who were in HR and older people who were in HR. And the older people said, when I look at a resume, I don't want to see a lot of movement. That means they, they would leave, move from job to job. That I wanted to see that they really did well in a job and they stayed in the job and they stayed for the long haul. Mm -hmm. The younger HR people said, oh, just the opposite. When I see someone moving around a lot, that means they go into a higher job and learning more, a higher <laughs> job and learning more, a higher job and learning more. Mm -hmm. It's amazing Great. how opposite it is. The, the, uh, um, the philosophy is. So people who are, you know, are managing them have to understand that's really about the difference in the generation. So silent generation, boomers, they really stuck they really stick to what their job and they you know are making money and, and they may have a slightly different uh, philosophy about how to do it, but they're long term, steady, I want to stay in a job, I want to feel secure. Gen X was a little different now. Gen X, which is sixty five to seventy nine, so um, they were not so easy with authority, also individualistic, but and much more comfortable with diversity, but they're tech pioneers. So they're really they're pioneers. They want to see, you know, they want to see that they're making change. They're very comfortable with that. Um, and they also the Gen Xers were looking for more independence. They want long, short, short and long term balance. So they'll move for for a gain, but they won't move as quickly because they're, they're looking for more balance. They want some flexibility in the conditions, but they also want long term financial security. So they're um, that's sort of, you know, in between the boomers and and uh, the millennials. So they're they got a little of both of those sort of values, you know, um, the way they operate. So now you have the millennials, which is 1980 to 2000, which a lot of us are dealing with today, and are saying, "Wow, they don't stay. <laughs> mm -hmm. What is going on here?" <laughs> so because millennials feel that authority has to be earned, you just you know, the other generations, if you were a manager, it automatically gave you authority. With millennials, if you're a manager, it doesn't always give, mm -hmm. automatically mm -hmm. give you authority. They have to know you deserve the authority. Hmm. Um, they're multitaskers. They're very tech-enabled. Um, they, they, um, you know, they just gonna, they just know that everything is revolves around technology. Totally comfortable with it. Um, but. They also define themselves by the tribe. You know, they don't date the way the other generations dated. You don't actually date. You actually go out in a tribe. Um, if you have children who are millennials, we have one son who is, and um, we ask him, do you ever go out? And no, it's, we all go out as a group, and if he likes the girl, they're still out in a group together. It's very different. They're, they're, they're very network-centric and tribe-oriented. I'll be darned. And they also value purpose. They want to know everything has a purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose, they're not interested, um, which is quite interesting uh -huh. because in the past generations, you wanted a purpose, but if it didn't have a purpose, you still knew, knew you needed to do it <laughs> uh -huh. because you wanted to earn a living. So uh, millennials don't see it that way. And so they see themselves as free agents, and, they'll, and they will move around. And, and, and maybe that's not so bad, so we'll talk about that because, you okay. know, maybe you can keep a great millennial for two or three years and someone else will and then they'll come to you and over time they will stay longer. So it's a sort of a process, but... Got um, it. And then you have Gen Z. I never heard of this one now. Uh, this is brand new. Really coming up very quickly. <laughs> um, so uh, they'll be, you know, working in your office in the next two, three years. Um, so they're totally not phased by new technology. Gen, Gen Z's, I mean, when they're like two years old, they're already playing with an iPhone. <laughs> I have a grandson that's two and a half years old, and he knows, uh, he took my iPad, believe it or not, oh my and I see him watching uh, Thomas, a, a movie, um, on my iPad, and I asked my daughter, I said, did you put this on for him? She said, no, I don't know how. He found my iPad, he knew how to hit a button and turn it on, he, he scrolled through with his finger and he saw the Netflix icon visually because the kid can't read. He's only two and a half. Oh God, this is he wild. He saw the Netflix icon. He hit it with his finger. He scrolled through with his finger to find the icon for Thomas the Train that he loves to watch, and he clicked on it and he oh, found it and he God. was watching on my iPad. He's two and a half years old. This is too much. Two and a half years old. <laughs> so imagine what this generation is about. I mean, we're going to have such a hard time understanding because they're so oriented that way. 
I mean, when they come to our office, this next generation, they're not going to be interested in the keyboard. They're in a touch screen. So we may need to think, wow, we should maybe be getting some touch screens for the Gen Zs, or uh, even millennials would probably love touch screens. Everyone's used to it from that, their, um, you know, their tablet. So a keyboard can become passe uh, for some of these, and, and everything is, and they can scroll and use their fingers to find anything. So, um, but anyway, so Gen Z, they're totally not phased by tech, you know, phased by new technology. The ki these kids are into face more than, than millennials. They're into face to face. Millennials are more, you know, they're texting and but actually Gen Zs, because they're so into technology, they also do like face to face, which will be different because that it'll be easier to maybe manage them. So they also value mission and pur purpose. And they do plan to be loyal to their employers, but they but they will have multiple careers. Because we're living so much longer. We all have to face the truth that you know, people will have multiple careers because they could work for 50 years today and they may not want to stay in the same thing forever. And they also, ha um, they're saying they're really entrepreneurial, they're entre um, that they're, they're really focused on um, being more business-like, which is great because one of the issues many of us have with staff is we want our staff to be entrepreneurial because we want them to help mm. us grow the business and to really embrace our clients and understand that they're all about customer service and, and you know, and they're all in control of their of, of the business in a sense. Well, I think we've seen a lot of uh, move in the last uh, couple of I mean, the last four or five years on entrepreneurial. I mean, it just seems like everybody's got a business. Everybody's starting a business. I got a business on the side. You got a business. It's just wild. I never, <laughs> right. I never had seen that before. And now you're telling me it's going to get worse or better, whatever it is. I think it's fun. I think it's fun because there's so much new thinking in it. It's just fabulous. Right. Absolutely. Now, now that, but small businesses really, really um, hire the most people in this country. Everyone thinks it's corporate America, but it's not true. The truth is, is small businesses are the, are the are the businesses that hire the most people in the country. Mm -hmm. More people work for small businesses than for corporations. Wow. So, um, anyway, so here you have this what we're calling the gen four generation mashup. <laughs> you already have it in your office. So you've got the silent generation. You've got the boomers. You've got Gen X. You've got millennials, and mm -hmm. these are coming up. They turn yeah. 16. Yeah. <laughs> so how are we going to manage? We're having a hard time managing four generations. How are we going to manage five? Oh, boy. So, but there is hope. So, you know, so you can see there's a big shift in the demographics that also you need to understand. Right now we think the boomers are the biggest pop – well, they are the biggest older population, but it's going to change. By 2020 – Silent Generation and the Boomers and Gen X will only be 30%. 50% are going to be Millennials within the, no, so we're now going to 2016. In four more years, we got to figure out how to keep these Millennials in our offices because they're going to be 50% of the workforce and Gen Z will be 20% in four years. So by 2028, Gen X will outnumber the boomers also. Mm -hmm. I mean, the boomers are, well, the silent generation will already be out of the workforce probably by 2028. Um, and the boomers will be at the top of the workforce. But Gen X will be the biggest generation, by the way, at that point. Okay. Pretty scary. Oops, this one's spinning around. <laughs> <laughs> That's just to make sure we saw it. Okay, I got you. I know. <laughs> I love that so slide. So businesses will need to engage you know, populations across this entire wide age span and management can't no longer be based on this production model of one size fits all. You can't have one methodology now for doing work. It's mm. just not going to happen. Some people are going to be comfortable sitting at their computer with a keyboard. Others are going to want to be at a tablet, sitting at a client, uh, where you know it'll just be different methodologies. It doesn't mean they can't work together, but you just got to know who likes to work in what way and how to give them the tools to work that way. Mm -hmm. So, so managing the same old way just won't work. All right. So one is we got to get rid of biases. I know what every a lot of people say the millennials are lazy. They 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 really they don't pay attention. They're you know. But it's not just because of that. It's because we got to understand what what engages them. So you got to look for the best qualities in each of the groups to see what what they have that you can work on to build on. So millennials are loyal if they have a purpose. Mm -hmm. So what I talk about purpose. Uh, one of the things that always amazes me about our industry is why we haven't changed the name yet from insurance. <laughs> because everyone thinks of insurance as an insurance policy. We're about risk management. We're about understanding risk. We're about protecting people from the risks that they face, both 
from business and a personal perspective. And today, risk is everywhere. I mean, we have global risk. The industry is dealing with the most extraordinary things, and we talk about insurance. Insurance is just one piece of what we do. Um, and so a millennial needs to, you know, you could tell a, a boomer or a silent generation, we're in the insurance business, this is what we do, do this, do that, do that, and they're okay with that. They'll figure it out. But you can't do that with a millennial. A millennial, you have to say, why? I mean, a millennial has to, you, you take a millennial to, to your client and let him look at all the issues that your client is facing if you want to train him so he understands risk. And that's exciting to them. Today, there are risks that they would get. They get the, the issue of, of viruses on your computer, that someone could, you know, get into your system and steal your data. Um, they understand risk. So the key is millennials have to have purpose. You've got to explain to them. You have to take them visually. They don't want to hear it in the abstract. They want to see it. You have to visually show them why they have purpose and what they're going to do has meaning. Okay, and they will stay longer if you do that, but they may not stay forever. <laughs> Unless you have a really good career path for them, they may not stay forever. Right. Um, and but that's okay if you can get ten years out of a out of a millennial because you gave them purpose. Then someone else's ten year millennial will come to you, and you'll build on that. Um, and then, like the silent generation, the boomers. More of them have to have to embrace change, and a lot of them are frightened of the change. But you know, as I said earlier, you just have to let them know they're doing change all the time. They have smart. I mean, I remember, you know, just remind them of all the old things they used to use. They used to use a thermofax machine. They would hate that. <laughs> you know, they they could you couldn't you didn't have ATMs. You had to go to a bank. I mean, now you can do your deposits in your office, and you just remind them of the things that they have that they love now and so they have to just reorient and say oh yeah this is good for the office too so what you do if you compare millennials with you know some boomers um, and boomers learn how easy the technology really is to change and the millennials learn why the industry has purpose because you yeah. know the boomers know how much how well how um, they have helped their clients over the years so you know you pair them and so that they can learn from each other you pair them off and of course, then there are you know tech savvy experts in all the generations. There are silent generation experts all the way down, and they're hardworking. And they're and they're also very hardworking millennials. Not all millennials um, are lazy or leave after a year or you know. Though I hear that a lot. It's maybe it was just either the wrong millennial or they never took the time to teach them purpose. But, you know what is the purpose of what they're doing and give them the opportunity to see where they can grow. Um, because millennials want to know they can grow. I love purpose. I love. I think that's a wonderful. That's something I'm really learning from you right now. I never thought of that. It's much more. Yeah, it's no. much more vital to give them that road to run. I can. I can see where. Go ahead. Go ahead. Excuse me for interrupting. I'm just yeah. No. I, it's it's really um, it's a problem. The industry doesn't talk about purpose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even when you talk about risk management, it's sort of an abstract. It doesn't. You don't connect it clearly to what that purpose is and right. how the difference you're making. Right. Yeah. So you have to have, of course, a flexible approach to see what works. You have to try and test things, how they go. And then you have to build cohesion within, you know, within the groups. So you should, you know, I, I think one of the best ways to, to deal with a millennial is to have them shadow somebody mm -hmm. who really is expert oh. in what they're doing in your office. Mm -hmm. Not just tell them what to do. Yeah, let them shadow. Take them to a client. Shadow you. See the questions you ask. Learn about the client. Well, you know, so have them shadow someone for a month or two and before you even put them on a desk so they get why this is so meaningful and and what they can do to make it you know uh, better you know there's an agency that we've uh, that I've recorded and I will be recording a lot more it's uh, it's Gibson agency up in northern Indiana anyway it's real big and they have a team approach we did a Monday morning with them a couple of weeks ago here or and we're mm -hmm. going to do some more they're so good but my point of it is they break up into teams and the teams of course now they're they're, they're hiring from the, from the colleges the universities and the team might have say five five producers and they they all operate on the same team they go after the same account together and everything else but that's fascinating because what they're doing is just what you're saying they're bringing these right. younger guys in but the over the older and with the older things and and they're perpetuating by team not just by by agency and i think it's just that's right that's exactly what i think you're saying Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And so you take the expert producer, and he, you bring in young people with him, and you have them, and they work together as a team. He helps them. That's right. And he, and he shows them, and he brings them to client. You can't have them work at an office first. You have to bring them to see, even if they're not producers, and they're just going to come in and be your account managers. 
They have to see the real thing. Okay. We could work in the abstract. I mean, I, I know in my agency, um, I, um, I would uh, take my, my account managers that would, to meet the accounts they manage so they understand them. Um, but in many agencies, the account manager never leaves the office. They never really understand the client because they've never been to the client. Mm -hmm. They never understand the, the risk, the exposure. So without, it's harder to, without that understanding, it's harder. Um, but, but boomers were willing to do that. Even Gen Xers, millennials are not willing to do that. <laughs> they want to see it first <laughs> before they do it. Got it. So, so um, what motivates employees is also changing dramatically. And purpose has a lot to do with it, too. Um, so employee career aspirations, it's about work-life balance, <laughs> believe it or not, 50% of people today want better work-life balance. And the reason why is they recognize technology is enabling that. Because they know they can work from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And many of them say, look, I gotta go home for my kid, he's sick, I'll work from home. And they easily can. I mean, I know we have, um, even my own, when I had my agency, I would have staff emailing it Sunday night because they wanted to clear out their email before they came to work on <laughs> Monday morning. Mm. So, That's good. Um, and everyone is wired today, even for business. So um, therefore, people want to know that they can have better work, life work balance because technology enables that. Seventy percent want to do, you know, be the best at what they do. Mm -hmm. Thirteen percent want to earn a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Eleven percent help other people, and six percent help society. But the biggest thing is life work balance, which is very impactful for our agencies because. That if people want that, if you want to really keep a person, it's not going to be about earning more money. It's going to be about giving them a little more flexibility. So if you have a parent that has to be home for a sick child, that parent doesn't have to lose a day any longer. You can set them up to work from home. That benefits everybody because they don't lose a day. The cl your clients are taken care of. Someone doesn't have to cover. <laughs> and they don't have to come back the next day and make up the work. And a client doesn't have to be unhappy because that day they were out and someone else was covering, they couldn't get to them because they had to take care of their own clients first. So it benefits everybody, you know, to have, be able to give people a little more flexibility in how they work because then everybody wins. Good. So the definition of uh, workplace, this is what they say, how they define workplace success. 26% is about happiness and enjoyment, 90% <laughs> salary, 18% doing the best work, 15% respect and recognition, 10% high performance. So it's happiness and enjoyment. And what the research also shows is that it's about the managers. People will stay at a job for less money if they love their manager because the manager cares about them, gives them the tools, helps them meet their goals, talks to them on a regular basis. If it's a bad manager, a manager who really doesn't interact with their staff, who really doesn't show that they care, people will leave. So it really has a lot to do with mm -hmm. managers, and the, the statistic is very clear about that. So if you don't have managers who are meeting regularly with their staff, individually, not just in a group in a team meeting, but having lunch with them, how's it going, how can I help you? In fact, that's a new movement in terms of um, performance reviews. The latest thing in performance reviews is to get rid of all those forms that everyone fills out and has to score. They say the research shows it never worked, nobody likes it, everybody hates it. What's more important is having a series of thought questions and conversation with each individual staff member, a 10-minute conversation every month. What's the goals? How are you meeting them? What's, what's got in your way this month? What's happening? Things are going great. I'm here for you. And every month have a conversation individually with each of your staff. At the end of the year, you have that total performance review from all the conversations you've had. And that's the new movement for performance That's reviews. beautiful. That's a <laughs> so, terrific. Yeah. I, hope, yeah. I hope people will listen so, to that. That's, a, that's wonderful. Never thought of it. <laughs> I, I, don't, I have not thought of it. That's a lot of change going on. It is. A lot of change going on. You're scaring me. <laughs> but keep going. <laughs> well, you know, one of the problems is we're sticking to an old paradigm. Those performance reviews really had to do with the production model. We're not in that kind of environment any longer. I got you. So, you know, that's why it's really changing. So here are the change drivers, technology, millennials, boomers. So it's about flex time, time shift, you know, shifted work days. So maybe some want to work five days compressed into four. Um, there's remote work options, permanent or as needed. I mean, somebody wants three months, has the, you know, they may want to say, okay, um, I'm having, you know, maternity leave, 
um, but I really want to be with my child for six months. Well, why not set them up to work from home? I, mean, I, I could tell you a story about a, a, bro a broker I was talking to, and, and he said, oh, one of my best, best people, she's like 47, a fabulous account manager, her husband just got transferred across the country. Mm. My clients love her. I said, oh, what's it's going to take me to replace her? I said, you don't have to replace her. Right. <laughs> set her up to work and where, where, where they're moving to. Mm -hmm. your, your people, you know, I asked him, do your clients come to your office? She's an account manager. Should she go visit clients? He said no. So I said, was it a matter there where she works with technology today? Wow. No one would know that she's still not in your office. Mm -hmm. so, Terrific. You know, we have, there's so many such flexibility today to keep talent. The key in our industry now is to keep as much talent as we can. And, and as long as we know these people have the institutional knowledge and they're great performers and the outcomes are great, what's the issue? Good. So, because we also, you know, so now you have cloud-based technology that can be done anywhere. You, again, it's about getting the work done, not where it's done. And purpose. Boomers want to continue to make a difference. Millennials want to know they are making a difference. There's increased loyalty if they have purpose. And when when people have purpose, they're more loyal to you. They're more productive. They'll spend more hours getting it done. So what drives millennial loyalties? Because there's a big issue today. Well, how do you get them to stay? <laughs> well, they need to know why their work is important. They also need to feel like they belong to a tribe, <laughs> which is why that team approach is very good. That team of five new producers working with an old producer becomes a tribe. And so they need that. They don't want to be stuck in a booth all by themselves, in a cubicle all by themselves. That's not and they, they go there periodically to work, but that's not how they want to spend their work life. And they want to know there's a career path. If they think all they're going to be doing, they come in, you stick them in this cubicle, you teach them what they need to do, and that's, and that's the end of it, and they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. It works for the older generation, but it doesn't work for the younger generation. And they want managers who listen to their ideas. And, you know, many times they think they know more, I mean, they think they know a lot, so they come up with ideas. But it's not about telling them no, no, no. It's about listening and saying, hmm, I understand you think that way, but let me pose this. Um, or maybe some of what you have can work with this or that. But you can't just discredit and ask, like, what do they know? They hardly have any knowledge and they're telling me what to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's about they just want to be listened to. It doesn't mean you have to do everything they ask. They want work flexibility. They definitely want to be engaged. And they want to be part of a team, not just told what to do. Wow. So, I mean, I hear it all the time, so that's why I, just, I wanted to put this slide up there that millennials, um, you know, because we deal now with a lot of brokers who are agents who are our clients, and they say, oh, I can't keep a millennial, they're lazy, they never want to get the work done. And I say, that's <laughs> maybe. You, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm looking at Justin Bieber and Taylor Swift, just, my guy. I mean, yeah. I know, look, these are all, these are all millennials. They're yeah. extraordinarily successful, so many of them. And, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg is only in his early 30s. He, he built, you know, Facebook know. when he was, like, in you know, college. I know. I mean, these people are really very, you know, um, smart. They, they're not lazy, but they need to know why they're doing what they're doing. And so, you know, it's about um, if you have a millennial and that, that's not producing, you've got to not think maybe – it, maybe it's you and how you're dealing with that millennial, and it's not just the millennial. Sometimes it is. Not every worker is a great worker. And we know that, but, right. and that could be in any generation. But every generation has the potential if you understand how they work. Poor Zuckerberg only has, so, only has $47 billion, though. I mean, come on. That poor guy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, and he and his wife are going he and his wife are going to give away forty-six billion. Yeah, it's it's wonderful what they're doing. Right, really. I know, I know. And we, I know, you see, because they have social purpose. Notice these young, these young um, yeah. millennials who are making all this money. They want to do social causes. Good. You know, they're really about that. Mm -hmm. So it's because they have to feel they have more purpose. Yeah. So on the one end of the spectrum, these are your millennials. On the mm -hmm. other end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. in your workforce, mm -hmm. so you have these young ones. <laughs> You have then these. Are people ever too old to work? I was with Norman Lear in June. He's 93 years old. Oh, my gosh. There he is right in the, uh, the second picture in. Yeah, I know him. 93. He's just written a book. He's touring the country on a book tour. You know, he's the one who wrote Archie Bunker <laughs> and a lot of TV shows. And one-liners were still flowing off that man's mouth. 
He what? was hysterical. He what? looks great. Oh, he's, he's, he's great. 93. What were you with him for? <laughs> what were you doing? Just what was it? Uh, well, there is. I belong. I go to this group. It's called the Boomer Venture Summit. It's out in ooh, uh, Cupertino ooh. in San Francisco. Oh boy. Um, because a lot of the tech companies are now investing in the elder. I call it the vintage space because we're. <laughs> you know, my parents are in their nineties. They're seniors. I'm not a senior. You know, I, I call myself a vintager. We go from middle age to vintage age. When you you're go. eighty, you become a senior. There you go. But they're all studying this marketplace because they see it as a huge opportunity. We need, we're going to have so many older people. How are we going to take care of them? How are we going to deal with it? What are we going to do? And, and so every year in June, there's a meeting called the Boomer Venture Summit. And one of the businesses, young businesses coming out who are, who are addressing that population. That's so, fascinating. And he spoke I, at it. Yeah, well, I do know, uh, yeah. this is a side, a side point, Norman Lear, I reckon, because we lived in Los Angeles for many, many years. And my son used to date his daughter. I wish he'd married him, and, <laughs> but that's another story. But uh, no, no kidding, it's really true. But they, that he was he was so well respected. He still is, of course. Oh, he still is, and he's all about. He's very runs. He runs a huge charity. I mean, he gave, donated. He really gave his life to charity after you know he finished writing for TV because he made a lot of money, and he's um, and that's know. what he's about. He's he's really terrific. You know, and, and I, then you take a look. Well, I'm just going to say, yeah. excuse me for interrupting, but, you know, before you go for the slide, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, uh, of course, is, you know, what can you say about Warren Buffett hadn't already been said, but I can remember vividly right. when, when government employees insurance company was going to hell way, way back. I don't know, maybe 34, well, however, before he bought it. And uh, God, you could bought stock for a dollar a share or something like that. But I was too smart to do that. I knew it wouldn't make it. I only probably cost myself the rest of my life the whole morning. And every time I see him, I think, "You dirty dog! Why didn't you let us know?" But he's wonderful, wonderful guy, boy. Oh, absolutely. And look, and he's look, still vital at you know at his age. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at Clint Eastwood. I mean, he he at eighty five, he made American Sniper. Oh, amazing! Um, amazing. You know, uh, you know, look at all of them, Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, Paul Simon. I, you can just go on and on. I know. With people who are in their seventies and eighties and nineties. <laughs> I mean, look at Hank Greenberg, Star to Star. I mean, they're still vital, and they're, they're the silent generation. I know. So imagine, you know, what, what the boomers are going to be like. You know, today they say that a child born today will live to be 100. Wow. Can you imagine that? Wow. No. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. ima imagine the future workforce over the next 10, 15 years. Good point. How we see the dramatic change today, that's going to be even more dramatic over the next 10 years. All right. It's just amazing. It so, is. It is. <laughs> what I always say is age doesn't mean you have a shelf life. We're not like a box of cereal. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you, know, okay. you know, we can, you know, we don't. And, and the other thing about that, there's new research out that's also quite, um, you know, uh, many people thought that the brain stopped growing when you reach like 45. Mm -hmm. That was the mm -hmm. typical understanding. And the newest research shows that that's not true. What is true is the memory side of the brain begins to atrophy a little bit. It does not continue to grow. It just it just gets mm -hmm. a little less. Mm -hmm. But I say, all right, I can go today. You know, who needs a memory? Just look everything up on the internet. If I can't remember a word, I look it up on the internet. But what continues to grow is the other side of the brain. The brain where you where experience gives you judgment, the ability to solve a problem. They now know that that continues to grow. That's why they say wisdom comes with age. <laughs> so it uh -huh. turns out that that happens to be scientifically true. <laughs> Good. I have hope. Huh? So. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm glad. So each generation, you know, um, so just to sort of recap, each generation does want work flexibility today, and that's going to be important for every agency to understand. Millennials want, may want to split their day between the office in the morning, gym at lunch, a cafe meeting in the afternoon with the client, volunteer work in the evening, and then work at home till midnight to get all this stuff together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, we think, because I hear it all the time, because when I talk about Waze and I say these people are working from home, people say, oh, my God, I can't manage somebody who's not in my office. And I say to them, okay, so, all right, how many cubicles do you have? How many people do you have in your Oh, I have 15 people in my office. Um, are they all in a circle in, in your office so you can see them all day long? No. <laughs> or are they all sitting in their own cubicle? And where are you? Out helping clients? I mean, do you actually sit in that cubicle every day to see what they're doing? Or do you look at the outcomes? Do you see the results? 
Mm -hmm. I said, it's, it's not true. You're not, I mean, I ran an agency. I didn't know what all my people were doing. I, I knew when someone was standing in the corner chit-chatting and not getting the work done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but sometimes maybe they were talking about a client. I wouldn't know. It's about outcome. You know? So, um, so you got to look at that, how people will get their work done. It don't, they don't all have to do it the same way. Gen Xs may work in the office three days and from home two days and, and nights and weekends to allow for family time because they want family time. And to keep talent, you, have, you may have to figure out how to do that. Do you need everyone in the office at the same time every day, or do you just need core time? Because you don't, people just don't spend all day long together. They're doing their individual work. But if you want some ideas to cross, you know, that's one of the things I thought, what's her name at Yahoo, didn't do right. She made everyone come back in. No, make them come back in some of the time. You don't need them there all the time. And she lost a lot of talent. So Yahoo isn't doing so well mm -hmm. because a lot of her talented people who are used to working that way, who had the institutional knowledge, were scooped up by other companies who gave them a better work-life balance. Good, good, good example. I like that. Yeah. So, um, and boomers may work remotely via laptop and divide time among a summer home, winter home, visit with the grant with their kids and grandkids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they feel they paid their dues. 30 years in an office, I, you want to keep me, give me some flexibility because I, you know, and I'll get the work done. You know, I know how I, you know, you know, I'm a great worker. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's about who the person is and getting the work done. And then other boomers and members of the silent generation may be waived. <laughs> that's your <laughs> working exclusively from their home and wherever they happen to be. Sure, that's your that's your business. I want people to remember who wave is, and it's working at home. What's the 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 work at home? Vintage employees. Vintage Vin again, employees. Again, I call it vintage. I, I hated the word senior graying. Uh. Uh huh. Got it. <laughs> First of all, women never gray. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Us too. Um, anyway, so only time will tell, you know, what the priorities for Gen Z will be, but this is, these are really the flexibility priorities today. And if you want to keep talent, you really need to consider these flex, you know, flexible options. Mm -hmm. And boomers are definitely changing the retirement paradigm because people, and I, I call it now the pre-tiring, they're really not going to retire. Mm -hmm. They can't because life expectancy is steadily increasing. Those over 60 plus are healthier, were more active. I mean, years ago, everyone had to, you know, when they got older, they went on a cruise. They ate themselves to death. Today, you see 70-year-olds on a biking tour. <laughs> they're oh, biking, yeah. they're hiking. You know, they're doing, they're, they're, they work out, they do yoga, they're jogging. It's amazing. So they know that they're, be, they're staying active, they're going to be healthier. So they're still vital. It's changed dramatically in 20 years. It's some, you, you, when you... I look at my parent. I mean, look at the 20 years ago generation, and my grandparents. They were old when they were 55. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, we're not old today until we're 85, maybe. <laughs> so. Thanks. I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so compared to their younger counterparts, vintage workers, and this has to do because the brain continues to grow in this way, because they're more knowledgeable from all the years, they're more experienced, they're more productive. They're more reliable, they're more emotionally stable at this point, mm -hmm. and they're better equipped to stand back and see the big picture. Mm -hmm. That's where the brain continues to grow. So can you imagine if you take a, you know, a boomer, and they're a vintage person who's got this, and you, and you pair them with millennials who have great memories, they know everything that's going on out there, they've seen every TV show, they know everything on YouTube, I mean, they can bring a lot of information to a boomer. <laughs> And a boomer can help talk through the way they solve problems. How you know what a, you know bring out the the knowledge that they have, the experience, and talk about the the the, the accounts and and how you ad analyze them and manage them and and how you problem solve them. So you take two extraordinarily not only in terms of technology skills, but also in terms of of the, how the brain operates, because the young people have this great memory, older people have this other side that really has the wisdom. So it's not just about that, it's about when you peer both sides of the brain as well, that you get something that's even bigger. And employers benefit from seasoned experts' wisdom, the ability to compromise, as well as technical and strategic experience. So that's why you want to keep your, your, you know, your boomers. Um, and boomers want also life work balance. They have the institutional knowledge. They've got the computer skills. There's no reason why can, they can't have some flexibility to work from home and they get the work done. And here, so here's the other side of the coin today. And you see it in the shared economy um, that a lot of workers don't want to be an employee any longer. 
they want to be, they call them solo on, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, a freelancer, some of them are calling them gig workers, and some only want temporary work. And that's because they want more control over their lives, especially those who want to be freelancers. They don't want to just work for one person. They want to work with multiple people, learn the differences, hone their skills more from working for different people, um, and work and, and have control over their life. And that's growing. And that 34% of that American workforce, if you look down here at the chart, mm -hmm. this is how it breaks out. So it's all across the board. I mean, the, except for the silent generation, because mm -hmm. you know they're really just used to being in an office completely. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see the boomers, 30%, um, are into being freelancers today. They're going out on their own, doing consulting. They they just done in the office. They're done being an employee. <laughs> And they'll, you know, they'll just, they want to do freelance work. Okay. Um, you have 29 in Gen X and you have 28% millennials. So it's across all those three generations. Mm -hmm. um, and because they just want to control, you know, what they do, how they do it, for whom they do it, when they do it. And technology is enabling them to do that. So here's what's happening. Technology and demographics are leading to all these changes in our workforce. So. So who's going to be in your workforce? You're going to have traditional office workers. You're going to have multiple generations in the workforce. You're going to have contractor, gig staff, freelancers. And you're going to have what I'm calling our ways, pretirees. Because they've left the regular workforce, but they want control over their lives and to continue to work. And how you can do it, you have to have a culture of flexibility. You can't be one way fits everybody. Because you'll lose talent that way in any generation, maybe except for the silent generation. Um, you you should have you have to how is to have some flex you have to have flex time and even maybe flex locations, um, you know so that you you know people can work from anywhere maybe um, you need to have choices in managing time people can say you know I, I need to I need to have I only want to work three days a week but I'll put in twelve hours for those three days and then I'll put in these many hours at home you you have to listen to what everybody you know you have to. You have to have a conversation with your entire staff, an open, honest conversation about what kind of flex time different people would like and how they can all work together to figure out how to make it work. Um, because it's, it's happening. So to, to deny it and not talk about it, um, you may end up losing some talent because this is a really growing thing. Um, some people might say, look, I, I really need reduced time now because I'm going through this life thing. Um, I can't work full time. Um, so you need to have that kind of flexibility as well. There's also about time off. So another thing that's happening with a number of companies, um, I know Netflix has done it and a few others, um, and that is then there, there is no longer personal days, right? You know, everyone mm -hmm. gives you, okay, you have, you know, 15 personal days, however you want to use it. A number of companies have found that to track the personal days, what it means, I mean, it's, and, no, and it's such a nightmare, and does this carry over, does that carry over? Mm -hmm. A number of companies have said, forget it, no more work day, no more of that. Take whatever time you need. Mm. You know, everyone needs to have some time off, we mm -hmm. get that. Take whatever time you need. Now, if you have flexibility where they can work from home, they don't have to take their time off when they're sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is about, you know, vacation time, personal time. But if you're going to take your time off, because every time you're out, you have to put it in the calendar so people know you're not here. You have to make sure someone, someone in your team is covering for you. Mm -hmm. And now if you take too many days, your team or people who cover for you are going to say something to you and say, for I'm sure. sorry, mm -hmm. we're not covering for you, therefore you can't take it. <laughs> so they sort of self-manage. And it's about the outcomes. And companies are finding that people are really not taking any more time off, but they appreciate it and their outcomes are all still there. Good. So. That's another new movement that's happening. Mm -hmm. So watch, watch for that. <laughs> and then people are going to have flex careers. They're going to go in and out of careers, and that's just the truth. Um, and you know, we have the ability to do that within our own offices, in a sense, because we have multiple kinds of jobs. You know, from personal lines to commercial lines, and within those, you know, personal lines and commercial lines, there are you know people who do rating, uh, quality control, account managers. So. We have a way to have people have somewhat of a flex career, depending on where they are in their life. If they want something easier, because it's the time of the life where they need something easier, we can give them some, train them in something easier or more, you know, more um, um, challenging. So we should think about that too. How do we help people within their lives have careers within our own companies? 
And of course, and then there's um, you know pre-retirement. And the key to success, again, right at the top, is purpose. Purpose, purpose, purpose. That's what everything is about today, purpose. And this industry is a lucky industry. I mean, I have a friend who manufactures bathroom towels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's having a hard time trying to make purpose. You know, they're making dice towels, but a lot of people make towels. You know, like, yeah. what's the big purpose in making a towel? Of course, he says it's about making the best towel, the nicest towel. People will feel good when they see their towels. But it's a harder purpose cell. We have an extraordinary purpose cell, one of the best in the world, and we don't sell that purpose enough. Second is collaboration. Today again, it's it's about collaboration. It's not about it's not no longer you know just authoritarian top down. Do this because I told you to do this. People collaborate in teams. You get more ideas. You you get more efficiencies. So collaboration is really crucial. Um, Engagement. People need to be engaged. They need to have the right tools. They need to find the, the tools that, that are exciting, that, that they, they need to know that they're involved in figuring out their jobs and solving problems on their jobs. They, if they're not engaged, that, you know, the statistic out there, believe it or not, is that uh, about 70% of the workforce are not engaged in their job. Ooh, that's scary. That's really high. <laughs> yeah. That's very, very high, it's, that's, and it's amazing. It's amazing statistics. So they're not engaged in their job. That means you're not getting the maximum benefit of that person's talent. And one of the biggest reasons they're not engaged in their job is their managers. Again, having really good managers. What happens many times with, uh, and I know it happened in my agency, and uh, I couldn't get to fix it, but um, we had some people who became managers because they were good at an account executive. We promoted them to manager, but they were not a good manager. <laughs> So you really need to have a manager who understands people and how to communicate with them and make them feel good about themselves and their work. Right. And when they're not doing a good job, understand what it is. And if it's not the right person on the bus, that they should get the person off the bus. And the other key to managing all of this is looking at the outcomes. And that's how you know how good your people are because they get, they get the, the outcomes that you want. They keep the clients. They upsell. They cross-sell. You get a high retention rate, um, and that's what, you know, so looking at the outcomes is what's important because I know, I'm sure all of you know, that there are some people who can get 10 things done well in an hour and another person who can hardly get one thing done well in an hour. <laughs> so you really need to look at the outcomes. And the last, of course, is leadership. Uh, leadership is not just about being a boss. <laughs> boss is one thing. Leadership is about leading being, you know, understand, leading your people with your own passion. If the leader doesn't have passion about what's going on, that filters down. The leader has to also have that passion, have that purpose, and engage people. And let and everyone needs to know that 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 the leader really feels that this is a wonderful place to work, right. and these are the reasons why. So leadership is really crucial to keeping a a talented staff. All right, so we're wrapping it up. Huh? Here we go. Yep, yep. Okay, so the future of work quickly is work will be done anywhere. It's about the right job, the right skills, the right resources, the right moment, the right quantity, the right people, the right price. It's going to be, this is what it will be in the next 20 years or 10 years even. And, we, and so let me just quickly tell you about Waves because I know we're coming to the end. So what we're really doing um, is we're really bridging the gap between um, insurance brokerage and insurance agencies need that you can't find talent and a seasoned professional who's now left the regular work office, wants to work from home, they work in their own home office, we contract them out to um, agents and brokers across the country to fill whatever need, whether it's account manager, whether it's policy checking, rating, claims, we even have some retired um, controllers, CFOs, so, and they don't want to be an employee anymore. Right. And they can work full-time or part-time, but they work from home. So um, we have a, a vetting process that totally qualifies them. It's very unique. We have built our own software. Um, we test them on technology. We have our own time done on insurance knowledge test, so we know they have insurance knowledge. Um, their pre-tirees, they have, well, that's, that should be 25 years. That's an error. 25 years of experience as an insurance professional. I don't know how that got to be 15, but 25 is our minimum. Okay. Um, and um, so we enable them to continue to work with what they know best um, mm -hmm. and to have a still have a productive life. 
They continue to support themselves in their retirement by supplementing their retirement income, and they keep the institutional knowledge in the industry because we still need their knowledge. And so we already have 300 WAVE experts. Wow, um, wow. Who we have matched with over 200 insurance brokerages across the country. Uh, we have you know, brokers as small as five people, all the way up to USI, Brown & Brown. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Willis. So, you know, and we even work with some insurance companies that wholesale was as well. Um, oh, I didn't so, know that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're working with Beasley. We're working with um, with Berkeley. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah, I got carriers you. <laughs> and and yeah, because we have a lot of underwriters on our database as well. We have over five thousand pre-tired, qualified industry experts on our database wanting to work from home. Oh my god, yeah. that's unbelievable. Yeah. And it, when did you start this? How many years? Five years ago. Wow. Yeah. This is phenomenal, yeah, yeah. phenomenal, phenomenal. Well, here's the... Well, that was one way to solve the problem. Everyone was talking <laughs> about we're losing all this institutional knowledge. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? How do we, and we can't seem to attract enough millennials. So I said, well, there must be an opportunity here. And when there's a problem, there's got to be a solution. <laughs> and, that, and one day I woke up and I said, oh, I think I have it. Well, now, what, uh, let me ask one uh, thing here, Sharon. The, the, uh, if I were an agent and... Uh, I had, uh, you know, I'm overwhelmed and I don't want to hire anybody new. Is that what, is that the guy who calls you or gets with you? or? Yeah. How? I don't want to hire anyone new um, or I need someone part-time or um, someone left and I can't find a replacement um, or I'm growing and I can't find the person who, I can't find a good account manager. I've already tried three times and, and uh, they keep leaving or I have to fire them because they don't get it. I mean, anytime there's a, 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 a staff need with the Someone has to have some knowledge. That you need someone who has the knowledge who can walk into it. Our people, within three days, they're 100% functional because they we match them to exact agency management system. So, if you're on 360, if you're on Epic, if you're on um, Fujita, right. so they don't even have to learn your math. They just have to learn your workflow, and they are just. I mean, if you go on the website, you'll see our clients and our ways say how they just how they love it. It's just a it's a perfect match. We're like Match.com. Instead of romance, it's for work. <laughs> You're something else. Listen, we better let them go because it's been a long one, but it's been a necessary one because it needed to be said. I don't think anybody's had a uh, had a, a presentation of any kind that compares the millennials, the Zs, the everything else so well and puts it right in. And I want to thank you for taking the time and effort to develop this. I'm knocked out with it. And I hope that people will follow up with Wave. I always tell you this. I've never talked to anybody using Wave who wasn't happy. Never. Oh, thank and so you. I want you to know thank that. And so I'm much. really proud that you took the time to do this. And uh, having said that, uh, the rest of you will see you next Monday morning.